Dave is a 27-year-old painter and decorator who was standing on a ladder when he slipped and fell to the hard ground below. He unfortunately landed directly on his outstretched right hand, damaging it badly. He was in intense pain under his anatomical snuff box and was unable to move or use his hand very much. Fortunately, his friend was nearby and was able to drive him to a hospital where he received a series of x-rays before being treated surgically for his injury. My name's Connor, and today we're going to be covering the anatomy of the bones of the hand as well as some of the common fractures and their consequences. Welcome to 5 Minute Anatomy. Let's start with a quick overview of the surface anatomy of the hand. There are five digits which are numbered from lateral to medial. The most lateral digit is the thumb, followed by the index finger, middle finger, ring finger and little finger. Our main bony landmark on the posterior surface of the hand is the knuckles, which are protrusions produced by the metacarpal heads in the metacarbophalangeal joints. There are 27 bones in the hand and they are approximately arranged into tiers. The most proximal tier is composed of the eight irregularly shaped carpal bones, which we'll cover in more detail in a moment. Next, we have the five metacarpal bones. These bridge the gap between the carpals and the phalanges, and there is one for each digit. The metacarpals themselves can be divided into a base, a body, and a head from proximal to distal. Then we have the five proximal phalanges, the four intermediate phalanges, and the five distal phalanges. The thumb only has a proximal and distal phalange and no intermediate one. Now taking a closer look at the carpal bones. We can see that they themselves are arranged into two rows of four bones. Each has a unique name depending on their shape. We've covered the reasons for their names in another video that described all of the bones in the human body. So if you're interested in that, take a look there. The most lateral bone in the proximal row is the scaphoid, followed by the lunate. These two are the main articular carpals with the wrist joint. Next we have the triquetral carpal, and roughly overlying this we have the sesamoid pisiform bone, which sits inside the tendon of flexor carpi ulnaris. In the second row we have the trapezium, which articulates with the thumb. Then we have the trapezoid, the capitate, and the hamate, which has a prominent hook known as the hamulus. We also have a video showing how these bones work together to form the carpal tunnel, so check that out if you're interested. Now we'll cover the ways the numerous bones articulate with one another in the hand. There are many different types of joint in the human body and each serves a unique purpose. The simplest joints in the hand are basic sliding joints, which allow only gliding movements to contribute to the shape of the hand. In the hand, the carpal joints are all gliding joints. Next, we have the slightly more complex hinge joints. These allow simple flexion and extension, like a door hinge. In the hand, all of the interphalangeal joints are hinge joints. Increasing in complexity, we have condyloid joints. These allow flexion and extension like hinge joints, but also allow limited abduction and adduction and some rotation. These are essential to allow the hand to curl up into a fist and grip objects properly. All of the metacarbophalangeal joints are condyloid in nature. Lastly, we have the single saddle joint. This is shaped like a saddle and allows flexion and extension as well as a substantial amount of abduction and adduction. The base of thumb joint between the first metacarpal and the trapezium bone is a saddle joint. Ok, let's finish with a quick look at what can go wrong. This is by no means a comprehensive list, but should give us an idea of the more common ways the bony anatomy of the hand can be disrupted. The first one we'll look at is a fracture of the body of the fifth metacarpal. This is otherwise known as a boxer's fracture as it's seen when someone hits an object very hard with a closed fist. This is usually treated with splinting and taping alone. Next, we have a fracture at the base of the first metacarpal bone, known as a Bennett's fracture. This is usually associated with a degree of subluxion of the thumb joint. It can also be seen following hitting a hard object, but it's also seen in bike and car accidents. They frequently require surgical fixation of some sort. Finally, we have scaphoid fractures. These fractures occur following high energy impact, usually during a fall on an outstretched hand. They're most common in men aged 20 to 30 years. Let's take a closer look at scaphoid fractures. You'll remember Dave from the beginning suffered a fall onto his outstretched hand and had to receive surgery as a result. The injury he suffered was a scaphoid fracture. Patients with this type of injury may complain of pain in the back of their hand, in particular underlying the anatomical snuff box 
which is a triangular region spanning between the wrist and the base of the thumb. The main worry with these type of fractures is avascular necrosis, which describes an interruption in blood supply leading to death of part of the bone. In this case, as the blood supply to the scaphoid bone is retrograde, meaning it goes backwards from distal to proximal, a transverse fracture can stop blood getting to the proximal segment and cause it to die. Some patients with minor fractures to their scaphoid and a preserved blood supply can be treated conservatively with a speaker splint, but more severe cases may need surgical fixation, often with a variable pitched headless screw. And there we go. That's the bony anatomy of the hand and some common fractures to be aware of. If you enjoyed today's tutorial, remember to subscribe to our channel and leave a comment below with what you'd like to see next. I hope you learned something and have a great day.